When talking about public intellectuals, it's obligatory to talk about their decline. The whole concept of the public intellectual implies a narrative of the fall. Once there were giants who spoke from on high and now they are gone. And there are a variety of culprits of this standard story. They're extinct because of political correctness or academic jargon or identity politics, so the story goes. So I thought it might be useful to just change the language for a start. So rather than public intellectuals, let's talk about general intellects. General intellect is a concept from Marx that I'm quite frankly misusing. In Grundrisse, Marx took an interest in the way what we might call cognition became a part of the forces of production. Machinery, or what Marx called dead labor, replaced living labor, but machinery also embodied in its iron form the cognitive capacities of our species being, which he called in English the general intellect. One can say a lot about the general intellect in Marx, but I want to switch gears and think about general intellects in the plural. I'm going to define general intellects as those whose work is cognitive more than manual, as with a lot of work in the overdeveloped world, and uh, whose work has become part of a general commodification of cognition. As I argued many years ago in Hacker Manifesto, uh, Hacker Manifesto, the property form changed a lot in the late 20th century, evolving elaborate forms of intellectual property, which come very close to being absolute private property rights. What I then called the hacker class uh, are those whose cognitive effort are caught in a mesh of technical and legal forms. Now, by hacker class, I don't just mean those who hack computer code. Hacker class is all of us who work, whose work is mostly cognitive and which is captured in the form of intellectual property where that intellectual property ends up being owned and or controlled by somebody else. So it doesn't matter if you work with numbers or language or code or images, it's all rendered equivalent as intellectual property. We become, we belong in the same class even though we do different things and have different and complicated identities. We belong in the same class because another class ends up owning or extracting most of the value from the product of our labor, which is information. One of the big stories we're still grappling with is how the effort of cognition could be captured technically as information and how information in its technologized form could be subsumed within the commodity form. But here it's not just a matter of some sort of monstrous eternal commodity form expanding to incorporate ever new things. The becoming commodified of information also changes what the commodity form is. So whatever this mode of production is that we're in, it's just not the same thing as the steam-driven capitalism Marx confronted in the 1850s uh, when he wrote the Grundrisse notebooks. I'm staying in a hotel at St Pancras and I keep thinking about, oh my god, this is so awesome, 19th century, but we don't live here anymore. What if this is not even capitalism anymore, but something worse? I think it's worth risking a new diagnosis of what the mode of production now is, and hence who the ruling class, or rather classes, are these days. Certainly a capitalist class that profits from the ownership of the means of production still exists just as the landlord class still exists that extracts ground rent, in fact, perhaps even from underneath where we are now. Yeah? Uh, but if we can acknowledge that there were always two kinds of ruling class, landlord and capitalist, as Ricardo knew and Marx knew, why not a third? Why not a new one? So I call the ruling class that emerged more closer to our time the vectoralist class. They do not own land, they do not even own the means of production. Rather, they control the value chain by owning and controlling information. They own the databases, the flows, and above all, the possible vector of storage and transmission of information in the form of intellectual property and patents, copyrights. More importantly, they own the logistics and protocols, <coughs> protocols by which the whole of production and reproduction is now controlled. So perhaps this is no longer a world in which we can just sort of apply Marx's concepts or, or anybody else's. Maybe with a modifier or two stuck on, on, on the front, neoliberal capitalism, post fortis capitalism. When your modifier's got a modifier on it, you've really messed with language, right? The poet in me just rebels. So it seems a bit unsatisfactory to think there is an unchanging capitalist essence that just changes in its appearances. Perhaps the form of control and exploitation has a new layer to it. The vectorless class, which captures the cognitive effort of the hacker class, to which many of us may belong, and uses that captured cognition, that proprietary information, to control value production, those other <coughs> or still existing 
uh, modes of production which might now be subordinate. Now, the vectorless class arose out of the stagnation of the capitalist mode of production in the overdeveloped world in the 70s. Organized labor kept pushing wages up, but the productive process could no longer be made more efficient using uh, in its existing form. The capitalist class looked for answers to what had hitherto been a minor branch of their own industrial base, the owners of information technology. But this turned out to be a devil's bargain for them. Shifting the commodity form away from products to information was in the end to the advantage of owners of information. Uh, just as capitalists had outflanked landlords with a more abstract form of the commodity, so the vectorless class outflanked capitalist class. Look at the composition of leading global firms today, and you'll find that many of them outsource the actual making of things to subordinate firms. What they own is information, something of which Marx was unable to form an adequate concept. Marx understood thermodynamics, leading industrial science of his time, but not information, the techniques of which barely, uh, was just barely beginning to exist. Maybe Marx can't help us with this historical epoch if we treat him as high theory, as a master who looked into the essence of the totality. We might need a different kind of intellectual effort even to think it. Conventional intellectual history gives us the fable of Marx as a singular giant or Weber or like name your master, uh, producing the intellectual synthesis uh, and critique of his age alone. But maybe this is misleading it was a team effort, even if we do not go quite as far as Alexander Bogdanov, who said that it was the organized working class that actually wrote Das Kapital with Marx as merely their stenographer. In any case, what we confront today may be a weirder and more tentacular beast than the vampire capital of Marx's imagination. It might take a collaborative effort to even describe and outline the world in which we live with its relatively novel kinds of exploitation and control. And so the particular quality I want to assign to the general intellects I chose to write about in the book, General Intellects, is that of not just being a part of this subsumption of cognition, but of trying to theorize some aspect of it at the same time. General intellects are both incorporated into machinic systems of dead labor and regimes of intellectual property, while they also try to think about it from within. Now, I'm using the term general intellects for that part of the hacker class that is relatively cognizant of the world it now inhabit, inhabits. But the problem for today's general intellects is that they or we are subsumed not into the totality of instrumentalized cognition, but only into some part of it. The work of the general intellect becomes part of the general commodification of cognition, but it's not entirely able to think this because the form in which the general intellect's work is commodified is always itself particular. To the vectorless class, we're all more or less the same as all of us produce information that be, can be commodified, but to each other, we appear as speaking a babel of different languages and holding up the masks of our carnival of different identities to each other. Thus, the attempts by general intellects to think the totality of social and historical life ends up being partial and one-sided. The habits of the particular information extraction process in which one works shapes how one perceives the world, what metaphors one finds most congenial for explaining it, and which forms of intellectual practice one thinks ought to be sovereign over all the others. Thus, if one is trained and works with language, as I was, one does indeed tend to think there's nothing outside the text, whereas if one studies politics, one thinks everything is political, if one is a sociologist, then it's clear reality is socially constructed. If one works in economics, then it's economics all the way down. If one is a coder, then everything is just more or less functional code. If you work with turtles, it's turtles all the way down, and so on. Thus, the form in which one is subsumed into commodification divides cognitive workers, hacker class, just as much as the manual working class. We take particular metaphors derived from particular ways of working and thinking as applicable to the whole. Nobody can grasp the totality of social relations from their particular speciality. There are a few traditional solutions to this problem. One is journalism. If general intellects are specialists rather than generalists, then journalists will be specialists who specialize in the general. But it's not working very well. Journalism is comfortable moving between different topics and dividing. Uh, diving into them to find out what's at the bottom, but 
journalism has the habit of fitting the new descriptive material into existing concepts and metaphors about the rest of the world. In the world of journalism, there can be a lot of new particulars, but the general is always the same. Another solution is interior to academic organization, interdisciplinarity. Uh, but it never really quite works as it should. It ended up being a way for disciplines to sort of bunker down in their hollow and hallowed conceptual cores and police their borders. The disciplines, as Steve Fuller says, are a necessary evil, and the more necessary, the more evil. They're donut-shaped, hyperconscious of their doughy edges, but hollow at the core. A more traditional academic solution is to acknowledge a sovereign discourse. Philosophy has only been too eager to play this role, at least in the context of German, French, or Italian cognitive production. Anglophone philosophy, uh, philosophy famously went the other way and became hyper-specialized on the protocols of language and logic upon which the whole industrialization of thought supposedly ran. So philosophers either want to be in charge of the whole or to be indispensable specialists for the language and logic part, and maybe they are useful in both those capacities. It's just that nobody else believes them. Back in the media world, we have a solution these days in the form of thought leaders. The thought leader dispenses with the necessity for academic or literary credentials. The beauty of thought leading, one has to give kick-ass PowerPoint, there's that, I suppose. It's like performance art. Uh, but the beauty of thought leading is that, uh, ooh, I just went backwards, is that one distinguishes a successful thought leader simply by the number of views of their TED talk or the size of their Twitter followership or the frequency of their blog posts. But it rather vitiates the venerable role of intellectual life and having something to say that's not based on exchange value. The thought leader format privileges the one big idea that will change the world, in capitals. It flatters the vanity of the vectorless class in its philanthropic mode that it alone can be the benefactor of the magic solution for all our problems. So, you know, uh, Bill Gates will solve it all, that sort of thing. So perhaps we need another path. Before turning to that, I want to map out various ways in which the Marxist tradition has thought about cognitive and intellectual work. And there are others, it's just those are my people, so that's the way I think the past. And here I'm uh, drawing freely on two authors I actually cover in the book, General Intellects, Franco Berardi and Angela McRobbie. So let me briefly sketch out where we've been on this topic so we can think about how to tackle it next. Marx inherited two models of the intellectual. The enlightenment figure of the intellectual as bearer of universal reason, the romantic figure of the intellectual as spirit of the people. And the Marxist intellectual is supposed to be a synthesis of both, but where reason can no longer be contemplative, reason must engage in practice in and against the world, and where the people with whom the intellectual practices reason are not a nation but a class, at the time the new industrial working class. Such intellectuals are imagined to be disaffected or marginalized members of the bourgeoisie, such as Engels himself, for example. But rather than focus on the intellectual inheritance Marx and his followers had to work with, perhaps we could also think about their means of communication and organization. The labor movement grew with the railways, the telegraph, the newspaper, and perhaps also in part because of them. They make it possible for a mass movement to communicate and know itself. Marx was, let's not forget, a journalist more than a philosopher, a very good one. This expanding vector of telegraph and newspaper uh, then augmented by telephony was the communication infrastructure of the labor movement at its peak uh, around the end of the 19th century. It was said of the uh, German Social Democrats uh, at their peak that they'd rather open a new journal than form a new branch. Yeah, that was very much a media apparatus. On top of that infrastructure, Kautsky and Lenin built an intellectual cadre uh, of a professional revolutionary party. Armed with the infallible and self-correcting method of dialectical materialism, the party is supposed to be the agent of totality, bringing the local and particular impulses of organized labor with its trade unions together in the service of achieving socialism. Uh, and the key figure for them is the professional organizer. Uh, the young George Lukash made the mistake of trying to further subordinate not just the trade unions to the party, but the party to the party philosopher. So they smacked him down for that. Now there's a different emphasis in Antonio Gramsci where what's more interesting is the idea of the organic intellectual who might rise up out of the skilled uh, and organized fractions of the working class itself. And it's an idea incidentally that Gramsci may partly have got from Lenin's rival and nemesis, Alexander Bogdanov. In Gramsci, the intellectual world becomes not just a supplement but a field of struggle in its own right. 
There's a struggle for intellectual leadership to build a counter-hegemonic culture. As one of the bases of social transformation in parallel to the struggle at the side of production but subordinated to it. The means at Grumpshie's disposal were still those of the era of telegraphy, telephone, newspaper, literature, and so on. Whether in its Leninist or Grumpshian form, the party exercised a certain fascination over intellectuals from the October Revolution in 1917, happy anniversary or not, to the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, uh, at which point it was definitely in crisis. Uh, throughout that time, the party built its own media and educational apparatus, its own schools, its own journals, even its own novelists and filmmakers. It built what Alexander Kluger uh, called a counter-public sphere. The party gave rise to a whole new category as well, the fellow traveler. Uh, I'll mention just two. Uh, firstly, Pierre Paolo Pasolini, a one-man media machine more or less aligned with but independent of the Italian Communist Party. He wrote poems, novels, articles, made movies and televisions. So you gotta really hate him because he was good at everything. He kept alive something of a romantic image of the proletariat within the emerging mass media vector that was superseding the literary and cultural apparatus of Gramsci's time. Secondly, Jean-Paul Sartre tried for a time to stake out a position for a committed intellectual outside the party, unanswerable to its discipline, while he still acknowledged Marxism as the horizon for thought, uh, you know, of which the party was supposed to be the repository of all wisdom. Uh, and the, the Sartre intellectual is a universal intellectual, addressing himself to a sort of riven and alienated totality. Sartre tried and did not really succeed in subsuming difference into this universality. Uh, but these days, I think one thinks of Sartre now alongside Simone de Beauvoir, but also France Fanon and Jean Genet. Uh, it's in the shadow of Sartrean commitment and universality, perhaps, that we learned about difference. Here a path opens toward what Foucault is going to call the specific intellectual, committed not to the totality, but to the political consequences of his or her own speciality. Now, at odds with all this uh, Sartrean commitment and its fellow traveling and its plunge into events is the tactical withdrawal of, say, Theodore Adorno, taking refuge in art from the extorted reconciliation that exchange value forces onto pro the products of cognitive work, although even to describe it like that is to betray Adorno's dialectical language. Now, we think of Adorno now as a sort of hermit writer, a bit austere and remote, but he was a public figure in post-war Germany. Uh, instrumental in creating a non-fascist culture. Uh, his Minima Moralia, believe it or not, was a bestseller. Uh, but then there's also a more engaged version of the Frankfurt legacy, a kind of Hegelese for beginners, uh, attention to alienation rather than production. In Sartre, alienation is just the human condition, whereas in Herbert Marcuse, it can be overcome, if not by labor now subsumed into capital and by other social agents who get to be the bunny who's the agent of history. Marcuse cuts an unlikely figure in the post-war counterculture wearing a suit and tie in the California sun. He was a paperback hero, his books circulating widely in the mass print intellectual culture of the post-war period. Uh, anyone seen that movie? Um, uh, I saw it last night in the hotel room, uh, Hail Caesar. There's a like fantastic portrait of the Marcuse of your imagination in, in that movie. I recommend it. Uh, but anyway, uh, this sort of like mass paperback uh, intellectual. Uh, it was there to sort of meet the vast expansion of higher education in the post-war period uh, all over the developed world. So the idea of the paperback theory book is a kind of post-war invention. All right, so Pasolini, Sartre, Adorno, Marcuse are versions of an intellectual practice that owes something to Marx but does not belong in the end to the party or even to the industrial working class all occupied positions that afforded them a certain autonomy of thought and action, either as successful authors in the case of Pasolini and Sartre, or within the expanding and reconstructed university in the case of Adorno and Marcuse. They vary enormously in political and theoretical outlook, but share the same infrastructure of the mass print, mass education vector of the post-war period. They became players within the spectacle, whether they wanted to or not. Now, Althusser is a different story, even though he was a university professor like Adorno and Marcuse, indirectly connected to mass intellectual publishing through an influential book series, but he was a party member, probably more sympathetic to the Maoists than the Stalinists. Althusser introduces two innovations, though. Uh, 
One was his insistence on the relative autonomy and distinctive materiality of the political and ideological uh, levels. Politics and ideology are not just forms of appearance of an economic essence. And this was enormously enabling, maybe too enabling, for those who preferred to specialize in the political or the ideological. French political theory, Anglophone cultural studies owes a lot to that moment. Now Althusser's second innovation is a little bit trickier. It's the idea of a theoretical practice. Sounds like an oxymoron. Like the young Lukács, although in a completely different idiom, Althusser makes philosophy the sovereign discourse. Theoretical praxis is supposed to be in charge of the epistemological rigor of all the other practices, particularly those newfangled ones in the expanded university like communication or technology studies. Once again, the party was not very happy about this usurping of their role, Althusser recanted, but the idea of philosophy as sovereign has not gone away and it left his traces in his student Alain Badiou, for instance, where philosophy remains one of those privileged routes to authentic subjectivity, along with poetry, mathematics, and something else, I forget. Now there's a lot of variations and alternatives to these more canonic versions of uh, Marx's intellectual. Uh, a few cute ones worth a quick mention. The social relations of science movement, strongest in Britain from the, who's heard of the social relations of science movement? Oh yes, two. All right, I still have to write the book on it though, right? Because everybody else needs to know. Social relations of science movement. All right, strong in Britain in the 30s, surviving through to the 50s. I think we sort of neglect, it's a, a neglected version of intellectual practice that had more to do with the model of the scientific worker and less to do with the philosopher or literary intellectual. It was an early version of an intellectual practice, uh, organic maybe, of and by the hacker class. Uh, so in Gramscian terms, for all the differences, Lukács, Althusser, Sartre, Marcuse, they're all traditional intellectuals formed in an ancient university culture. The social relations of science movement grew out of organic intellectual practices, out of a new nexus between science and industry, but it tended to fellow travel with communist parties pretty hard. It was forced into near extinction by Cold War black bands. It was anathema to the new left, which tended to the more romantic rather than enlightened side of Marx's inheritance, not to mention a touch of nostalgia for traditional intellectual life. Second movement worth a mention is the ultra-left avant-garde, of which the more aesthetically inclined are like more fun. Yep. For example, Situationist International, which did its best to refuse the party and the academy, even if it came a bit too close to the art world and private patronage. Guy Debord, it turns out, is, is a very contemporary character. He had private patrons his whole uh, professional intellectual life. Uh, I find the situations particularly interesting in that they were, to mix terminologies, organic intellectuals of the spectacle, of the rising forces of production, of the overdeveloped world. Michelle Bernstein, who was uh, Guy Debord's first patron, had a long career in advertising. Uh, who's seen the TV show Mad Men? All right, so if you can think of Michelle Bernstein as a slightly older and French version of Peggy Olsen. <laughs> Kid you not. Uh, when, I, when I met her, I thought, everybody talks to her about Guy Debord. I'm not going to do that. So I asked her about her professional life. And it's like, this, she told me this story. That's who she was. She worked in advertising. Now, the situation this great discovery was detournement, or the refusal of intellectual property. They're precursors to the theory and practice uh, of the commons in intellectual life. Thirdly, I won't deal with the Trotskyist version of this distance from Stalinist practices, uh, noble as it was. The thing about... Uh, Trotsky's followers is that they're always right about everything. They always are correct in theory and practice, and it's just not very interesting. Uh, the apparent co-option of the labor movement in some parts of the overdeveloped world, the rise of a mass intellectual formation through the expansion of the university, led to a shift in attention from the exploitation of labor to a more generalized category of alienation, and whereas for Sartre, uh, alienation was inevitable for Adorno. Non-reconciliation was the truth of art. Uh, for Marcuse, the overthrow of capitalism might still offer prospects for a reconciliation of the human with the world it produces. Uh, here's where uh, Mario Tronti and those who followed him uh, in Italy had a unique contribution. And the novel idea here is that the alienation of the worker from his or her labor is to be acknowledged, extended, and even desired. The working class ought really to produce itself outside of this alienating uh, productive world of capital. It should become self-valorizing, autonomous. 
and struggle to refuse work and to be as free from it as possible. There's a great movie called The Working Class Goes to Heaven that's kind of all about that. Uh, something analogous, uh, although in a completely different idiom, comes out of uh, Stuart Hall, British Cultural Studies. This focused less on the refusal of labor and more on the creating of a working class culture uh, outside of work in leisure time. Uh, and this is also where questions of difference really started to enter uh, Marxist or now post-Marxist discourse. The labor process makes all of labor equivalent, but in leisure, the worker recreates himself uh, in his difference. Only maybe he is not a he. Maybe she experiences patriarchal oppression or homophobia or racism. And once labor is no longer the primary category, differences in experience and the intellectual articulation come into their own. So, whether it was derived from the idea of an autonomous social life with the Italians, putting politics in command with the French, or the long cultural revolution with the English, there's a turn away from thinking the economic and technical transformation in a lot of the prominent intellectual work that went through in the 80s onwards, but it represents uh, a clear blockage of sort of industrial struggle and a sort of transference of hope elsewhere. But here's the thing, the generalization of information technology as the vector of control did not just transform labor, it transformed those spheres of non-labor as well. Leisure time was already well understood to be something organized by the culture industry or subject to hegemonic culture, but there's still a sense in which leisure time was free time. But now not only labor, but non-labor can be captured and information extracted from it and value produced. So even when you're not working, you're working for Google or Apple or Facebook, your non-labor too can be made equivalent as information, value extracted from it, and you don't get paid for it. It's like, could you please exploit me for this? It's like, no, you're giving it away for free. So social, political, or cultural en energy and autonomy has been captured again in the form of information and rendered productive in the service of what I would call vectorless class. And while I think there's no going back to the old language that subordinated everyone's struggle uh, and experienced the language of class, I think there's a new way in which the language of class helps understand a new kind of commonality in experience, even though experience itself is now experienced as a sort of kaleidoscope of intersectional differences. Those differences are the very thing that the vectorless class gathers and sorts and extracts a surplus from. We all became producers of surplus information. Identity politics is harvested as the free labor of defining oneself as a target for niche marketing. This is something of a commonplace observation now, but I want to pay tribute to those who saw all of this coming. It's perhaps not an accident that the best analysis and conceptualization and critique of the emerging post-broadcast mass media vector happened in and against the emerging forms of that media. The internet avant-garde of the 80s and 90s form the concepts with which to describe this state of affairs. They dispense with many of the habits of thought of the old style intellectuals. Uh, they develop new practices, such as what my uh, nettime.org comrades called collaborative filtering. There was a silver age of social media uh, when the long arm of commodification had not quite reached it or been transformed by it, when nobody really knew how to extract surplus information from it. Yes, there was a silver age of social media in the 80s and 90s, but it will have no golden age. I want to briefly pay tribute to some of those I remember from that world. Diane McCarthy, Pitt Schultz, Hit Loving, Brian Holmes, Wendy Chan, Alex Galloway, Tiziana Terranova, Lisa Nakamura, Coco Fusco, Matt Fuller, Kodo Ishan, Arthur Croker, Manuel Delanda, Richard Barbrook, Barbrook, good evening Richard, and the late Andy Cameron. I want to mention some of the forms of avant-garde collective action and digital intellectual organization that were among the experiments of the period. Electronic Disturbance Theatre, Critical Art Ensemble, VNS Matrix, the Barbie Liberation Organization, bless them. The Yes Men, the Institute for Applied Autonomy, Bureau des Etudes, Rax Media Collective, Old Boys Network, which was a feminist organization. NetTime, Sarai, Rhizome, Fiber Culture, Undercurrents, Backspace, Mama, Rig Competent, and of course, virtual futures. We were all fellow travelers of each other without a party. I mention all this because the myth has got about that a bunch of Silicon Valley venture vectoralists invented this brave new world all on their own. This was never the case, no matter what their publicists say. And to the extent that the social media vector still affords us a degree of freedom and agency, 
It's due to the efforts, not specifically to those avant-garde and critical thinkers, but to the social movements around free information, information rights, and information justice, of which they were the general intellects. Basically, I think one of the templates for a practice for general intellects comes out of that world. It's not one that has master thinkers or public intellectuals, nor is it quite the world of specific intellectuals of Foucault, which sort of becomes hostage to the academy again. The key term I take from this subset of social media avant-garde of the 80s and 90s is what on NetTime we call collaborative filtering. And the way I think that uh, and the practices that have migrated out of the listserv culture of the 90s via blog culture uh, the last dec decade, that's what General Intellects is kind of about. So the challenge then is to try to collaboratively produce an autonomous conceptual understanding of the current mode of production while knowing full well that this mode of production is designed to algorithmically harvest such concepts and turn them into marketing categories and investment opportunities. One has to work both in and against the vector, in and against information as a commodity form, but which might yet have other affordances. In an earlier moment, the situation as practice of detournement or appropriation or the commons seemed like a good idea, except that this got co-opted at a higher level of extraction, abstraction and extraction by the vectorless class. Google's a key example that depends on other people making information free so it can control the metadata about where all that data is to be found and the order in which it ought to be found. Hence, merely making things free is not anymore a viable strategy. So in the 90s, a lot of us were data punks. Uh, here's three megabytes, now form your own techno label, uh, as some people did. Uh, but now we need to be meta data punks. Did you say data or data in, in England? Data. 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 Sorry, I've, I've been in America too long. So let's create our own maps of the information vector. One way to do it is with concepts. Now, if a good fact is mostly true about something in particular, a good concept is slightly true about a lot of things. It's a very simple epistemology, but let's, right, let's have that for a start. Concepts are compressed, easily transmissible packets of information. But nobody has all the concepts they need to hand. We all work with particular slices of the information in particular ways and tend to map the world as if it were more or less the same as the bit we know. And so in general intellects, I made a compressed map of the territory adjacent to my own field, which is media theory. General intellects is a book about other writers of theory. There's 21 sections, and each of them is a quick economical approach to recent or key work. Most are academic, some are well known, others are not but should be. Uh, the book starts with two distinctive takes on the Marxist tradition from Amy Wendling and Cochin Karatani to bring out questions of technology uh, and to sort of decenter the West Eurocentric view a bit. Then we move on to Italian and French writers in something like the autonomous tradition, Paolo Verno, Franco Berardi, Yamali Butang, Maurizio Lazzarato. I was on a panel with him two days ago. Uh, next come two people from British Cultural Studies, Angela McRobbie and Paul Gilroy. Uh, to psychoanalytically inclined, uh, Slavoj Žižek, we've heard of him, right? Uh, Jody Dean, uh, political theory with uh, Chantal Mouffe, I put that one in just for Richard. Uh, Wendy Brown and Judith Butler, two theorists of corporeality, uh, Paul B. Preciado and Hiroki Azuma. A little bit of my home turf and people from the net time world, uh, Wendy Chun and Alex Galloway. Uh, a little bit of speculative realism. I did a bit on Tim Morton, uh, Quantum Miyasu. Um, we end with uh, science studies with Isabel Stenger's Donna Haraway. And these pieces, they're all only about uh, 4,000 words. They're appreciations, but critical ones. Critical perspective is informed by three things. Firstly, attention to how the forces of production have changed. Secondly, as I put it in the subtitle to Molecular Red, really ought to be doing theory for the Anthropocene. I mean, call it something else if you want, but we sort of have to think that. Not all our authors get that far. Thirdly, something I learned in the digital avant-garde of the 90s, life is too short for arguments. In each chapter, I try to map out where I think each theorist is useful and where they're not. I also map them uh, onto each other, a little bit onto my own research, but I don't argue too much with them. So the problem with knowledge production is that each field tries to make itself sovereign and argues with the other. And the book tries to practice a sort of collaborative knowledge production uh, that actually got out of uh, Alexander Bogdanov. Some, but not all, of the people in this book have those amazing jobs in American universities where you can write and think and do whatever you like. I do not have one of those jobs. <laughs>
These luxury jobs have a downside in that what the people with these sinecures produce tends to get a little bit baroque. The writing ends up being luxury writing. Now you can buy their books for about $20, but you need $100,000 worth of graduate school to unpack them. Now I've done uh, what you're no, not supposed to do with this writing. I've instrumentalized it, stripped it down to the concepts, shown how they work, shown how it connects to writing by others who work without those luxuries. So General Intellects is a bit compressed, but it's a book that's meant to be useful. I stripped out the good bits so you can grab hold of them and use them and make your own writing, your own art, your own design. So it's like, here's like, you know, 21 chords, form your own band, basically. Or your own techno label. Uh, so, oh yeah, I wrote that, I didn't need to improvise it. Here's 100,000 words of highly distilled, uh, highly distilled into low theory, do with whatever you want with it and happy travels. That's all, thank you. Thank you.